I'm very pleased today to be talking to Dr. Steven Pinker from Harvard University. He's the John Stone Family Professor in the Department of Psychology there and has taught additionally at Stanford and MIT. He's an experimental psychologist who conducts research in visual cognition, psycholinguistics, and social relations. Dr. Pinker grew up in Montreal and earned his BA from McGill and his PhD from Harvard. He's won numerous prizes for his research, his teaching, and his nine books, including The Language Instinct, How the Mind Works, The Blank Slate, The Better Angels of Our Nature, and The Sense of Style. He's an elected member of the National Academy of Sciences, a two-time Pulitzer Prize finalist, a humanist of the year, a recipient of nine honorary doctorates, and one of Foreign Policy's World Top 100 Public Intellectuals and Time's 100 Most Influential People in the World Today. He's chair of the usage panel of the American Heritage Dictionary and writes frequently for the New York Times, The Guardian, and other publications. Enlightenment Now, The Case for Reason, Science, Humanism, and Progress was his 10th and best-selling book published in February 2018. And it's very nice, by the way, to have the opportunity to speak with you again. And thanks very much for making the time. Thank you, Jordan. So can I ask you, it's been about a year since we talked last, and I guess I'd like to ask you, first of all, personally, what's this year been like for you? You've become a, a much more controversial figure, I would say, than would really be predicted. Like, you, you've always seemed to me to be a solid, reliable, interesting, mainstream scientist, not someone who would attract a tremendous amount of critical attention. And yet, you've become, well, oddly enough, associated with the intellectual dark web, whatever that happens to be. And so much of what you're doing is controversial. And so, What's that been like, and what's your life been like over the last while? Yeah, you, you wouldn't think that a defense of reason, science, humanism, and progress would be uh, incendiary, and I'm hardly a flamethrower. And, and as you know, I have uh, put forward some pretty controversial ideas in the past, such as that uh, men and women aren't indistinguishable, that we uh, all harbor some uh, unsavory motives like, like uh, revenge and dominance. But saying that the world has gotten better turns out to be a radical, inflammatory hypothesis. There, uh, there are, there's, first of all, just sheer incredulity because the view of the world that you get from journalism is so different from the view of the world that you get from data because journalism reports everything that goes wrong. It doesn't report things that go right. And so if there are more things that go right every year, there's just no way of, uh, of uh, learning about it if you get your view of the world from, from the papers. And so there's just sheer uh, disbelief. But on top of it, there are intellectual factions that are committed to the idea that the world has never been worse than it is now. And uh, data on human progress undermines uh, some of their, their, their foundational beliefs. And, and so that does attract uh, some, uh, some opposition. People think of it as a defense of neoliberal capitalism or a defense of uh, the opposite, secular humanism, um, traditional liberalism, and so it does get some people uh, exercised. Uh, basically, anyone, if you're a social critic, if your reputation comes on saying what's going wrong about uh, the current society, <clears throat> then um, you're kind of committed to the idea that things have gotten, uh, gotten worse, and uh, the idea that things are not as bad as they used to be, not as bad as they could be, is uh, an insult to that, uh, those core beliefs. Yeah, well, it's and it, it, it's a surprising thing because well, and so so let's let's talk about that a little bit. I mean, here's some of the things I know, I think I know, and maybe you could describe some of the things you know. And like, I started learning that the world had been improving when I worked for a UN committee about five years ago now, and started looking at the data on ecology and sustainable economic development, and that's. Like, there's some bad ecological news. I, I think that what we're doing to the oceans is 
fundamentally unforgivable and, and foolish beyond belief. But there's some ecological news that's of surprising positivity. Like there was a paper published in Nature not so long ago stating, for example, that an area twice the size of the U.S. has greened in the last 15 years. I think it was last 15 or 20 years. And that actually happened to be as a consequence of increased carbon dioxide because plants can keep their pores closed if there's more carbon dioxide and so they can live in more semi-arid areas. And there's more forests in the Northern Hemisphere than there were 100 years ago and more forests in India and China than there were 30 years ago. And then this has gone along with a massively improved stem standard of living. Um, the child mortality rate in Africa is now the same as it was in Europe in 1952, which is a statistic that I just regard as absolutely miraculous. The African economies are growing, sub-Saharan African economies seem to be growing faster at the moment, if the stats are reliable, than economies anywhere else in the world, partly because the Africans are getting connected electronically and have access to reasonable information and to something approximating, let's say, stable currency alternatives. Um, there, there's, and people are, pe the, the rate of poverty is diminishing at an amazing rate, right? We, we, we have poverty, considering it at $1.90 a day, between 2000 and 2012. And I've read criticisms of that, saying, well, that was an arbitrary number. But if you look at 380 a day, you see the same decline. If you look at 760 a day, you see the same decline, not as precipitous. And even the UN, not known, I would say, for its optimistic prognostications, estimates that at this rate, by the year 2030, there won't be anyone in the world who's living below the current poverty level. So, well, so there are some positive statistics. So what, what, yes. what, what would you like to add to that? Oh, yes. And th those are, all of those, those numbers are reported in, in graphs in Enlightenment now. But also, uh, what else? Um, uh, illiteracy is declining. Um, rates of, uh, of uh, violent crime, including violence against women and children, are declining. Child labor is declining. Uh, death and warfare is declining. Uh, people have more leisure time. They have more access to small uh, luxuries like beer and, uh, um, and uh, uh, getting, affording a plane fare. Uh, so uh, it, it's funny that, that all of these um, examples of human progress, which one would think vindicate the attempt to make the world a better place. It's not just do-gooding, it's not romantic, it's not utopian. We really can improve the world if we uh, set our minds to, to do it. Uh, should, should arouse so much anger, uh, partly because they, uh, people are so unused to thinking that things have gotten better that they confuse it with uh, certain kinds of magical thinking, such mm -hmm. as that things get, this must mean that there is a force in the universe that, that uh, carries us ever upward, that just makes progress happen by itself, which is the exact opposite to reality. The, the, the universe not only doesn't care about us, but it has a number of features that are constantly pushing back at us, like, like, like entropy, like, uh, um, like pathogens. Uh, like entropy is a bad one. And entry, entropy is, 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 the, uh, is the root of all human suffering, uh, ultimately. So the universe well, no, doesn't, doesn't care I've, about us? I, I've read, too, other things that are peculiar, that are so interesting. And Well, okay, so first of all, um, it's pretty hard on the Marxists, I would say, because even though there is inequality, and inequality is a problem, first of all, it doesn't look like inequality can be placed at the feet of capitalism. It seems to me to be a far more intractable problem than that. Second, it's clear that the poor are getting richer despite the fact of inequality. And third, and this is hard on the environmentalists, I think, is that it turns out that if you get people's income up to about $5,000 a year in terms of gross domestic product, they actually start to care about the environment, which I suppose is because they're not worried about dying instantly that day or that week. And so we, we seem to be in this perverse situation for a pessimist where we could make people wealthy and 
in, in a positive manner and we could make the world a better place simultaneously. And that does seem to be very hard on ideologues whose ideology is predicated on a fundamental pessimism. Or you get the other people, like the biologists do this sometimes and say, well, yeah, we're purchasing all this short-term prosperity at, you know, for these billions of people, but at the cost of some medium to long-term eventual precipitous, you know, apocalyptic collapse. And it's very difficult to formulate an argument against that kind of idea because, well, you never know when some, I, I think this is one of the things Taleb yeah. takes you to task for, doesn't he? Yes, I, even though I, I actually have pretty extensive coverage of the of tail risks, both in the better angels of our nature and in enlightenment now. And, and indeed, we, do, uh, we, we cannot take uh, incremental improvement as itself an indication that the um, risk of catastrophes is at an acceptable level, and it, and it may not. We, uh, it's very hard to estimate what the risk of a catastrophe is, but there are certainly some that we, that we ought to take very seriously. But you know, on the other hand, I, the, uh, the facts that you mentioned uh, are often resisted by, particularly by people in the green movement. I'm just going to lean down and pick up my earbud, which rolled across the floor. Uh, but if, if anything, it should give hope and, and uh, succor to the environmental movement, because it shows that it is not true that we have to choose between economic growth, which people do not want to give up, and protecting the environment, that, uh, that we can have both. And indeed, there are some ways in which they go together. The uh, nations that have done the most to clean up their environment in the last 10 years are the wealthiest nations because they can afford it. If you're dirt poor, as you mentioned, the, your first priority is putting food on the table and a roof over your head. And the, uh, you know, the fate of the white rhinoceros is pretty, going to be pretty low on your list of priorities. And you might be willing to put up with some smog in order to have electricity. It's really awful to do without electricity. And, and I know having visited cities like, uh, like Mumbai, which are horribly polluted, uh, and, and they, they are awful, but it would be much worse to not have any electricity. But on the other hand, when you get more prosperous, then you're willing to spring for the cleaner uh, energy, and you can afford the cleaner energy. And as you mentioned, your values tend to climb a hierarchy and more uh, long-term um, future concerns loom larger in your uh, value system. So it's, it's an odd assumption that both the hard right and the hard green have in common, which is that if we want to protect the environment, we have to sacrifice prosperity, go back to a simpler, more uh, peasant uh, style of life. Uh, the hard greens say, well, that we, we've got to give up uh, modernity, give up capitalism, go back to living, living off the land. The uh, hard right says, well, uh, I don't want to do that. No one wants to do that. So to hell with the environment. The, the reality is that if both policy and technology are deployed intelligently, as they, they ought to be, then we can afford to protect the environment without going backwards and foregoing all of the, the uh, benefits of modernity. Right. Well, I was, I was shocked when I started to learn about this, the fact that there was so much good, both economic and ecological news, um, with the economic news perhaps being somewhat better than the ecological yes. news. Um, and it doesn't mean that we can sit back and relax and the environment will clean itself up uh, all, all by itself. Uh, quite the contrary, we know why the environment got better. A combination of policy, like the Clean Air Act and Clean Water Act in the United States in 1970, and technology like catalytic converters and scrubbers and, and uh, uh, clean energy. So it doesn't happen by itself. The fact that it ha this is one of the great fallacies in people's understanding of progress, that they equate the existence of progress with progress happening uh, all by itself, as if, as if it was some force of the universe, which is uh, uh, contrary to uh, reality. The other, you, you mentioned that the existence of human progress uh, is, is a, a blow to uh, doctrinaire Marxists, which is certainly true because we have seen the spectacular economic growth of India and China when they liberalized their economies, and the uh, disasters of, say, North Korea with a, a beautiful control group, South Korea, same geography, same resources, same culture, same language, same history. Uh, what differentiates them is their political system, and South Korea is a much better place to live. It's not only freer, but it is also uh, enormously uh, more prosperous. 
But as well, I'm going that. to d- debate Slavoj Žižek on the 19th of April, and I've been preparing for that, you know, and I thought what I might do to begin with is list, there's a graph that I think humanprogress.org put out. Um, it might be Matt Ridley's graph, or maybe Hans, is it Hans Rosling? Rosling? It, it may be, it's Mar- Mariam Tupi is the proprietor of Human Right, Progress. but it's what they call the most miraculous, most important graph in the world, which shows this unbelievable acceleration of human prosperity, basically kicking in exponentially around 1895. And yes, yeah, so a little bit earlier, but uh, this is a combination of data sources, including um, a, 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 a late historical economist named Angus Madison, who began the Madison Project trying to retros- retrospectively estimate uh, GDP per capita in eras where they did not collect those data at the time, but using historical data. Yes, it is astonishing. And I've got to say, when I first saw that curve, uh, when I was working on Better Angels of Our Nature, um, I-, I was stunned. I mean, this is the, the original hockey stick. Graph. Yes, that's There's the hockey very, stick graph. That very little economic to. Until, until the Industrial Revolution, and then, then it uh, shoots up exponentially. Right, right. And so, you know, I look at that and I think, well, look, I mean, what's the issue here? We still have inequality, but you can't put it at the feet of capitalism because it seems to be a much more fundamental mechanism. Well, at least poverty, certainly, yes. Yes. Well, and and even inequality. I mean, there, there seems to be this proclivity towards the unequal distribution of phenomena, not just monetary phenomena, but I mean... If you look in virtually every domain of human endeavor that's associated with creativity, you get a Pareto distribution of productivity. You know, I mean, a small number of basketball players shoot the vast majority of the hoops and a small number of record uh, recording artists record the majority of the hits. Yeah. And a small number of planets have most of the mass. And like the, there is this, and I, I mean, I'm not, trying to make a case that inequality isn't a problem. I'm trying to make a case that it's a way deeper problem than the Marxists presume. And then you have the other problem that, well, the poor keep getting richer. I mean, half the world is middle class now, and obesity is a bigger problem than starvation. And so yes, when, when I'm talk, I can't, I'm really having a hard time trying to understand what the Marxists have left as a doctrine. It's like, well... <laughs> The problem you guys were identifying seems to not exist anymore. Yes, so uh, part of it is that their foil is a kind of um, Ayn Randian uh, objectivism uh, in which you have a pure, untrammeled, uh, unconstrained market capitalism with no regulation and no uh, social safety net. Now, one of the discoveries that that I made, uh, which was almost as surprising as the the hockey stick graph of prosperity, is the fact that in the 20th century, every developed country, every rich country, uh, went on a uh, spree of social spending. And so that from a baseline of about 1.5% of GDP redistributed to children and and the poor and the elderly and the sick, now the uh, median OECD country redistributes about 22% of its prosperity. And all rich countries are in a band from about 20% of GDP to about 30% of GDP. Uh, the United States is at the low end. Uh, actually, Canada, to my surprise, our, our home and native land is actually a bit lower than the United States. I still have people figure that out, even though Canada would appear to have a more generous uh, welfare state than the United States. And in fact, the United States would be even higher if you added all of the socialism that is done through employers, like retirement and health insurance, which in other countries is done through the government. But even if we just looked at government redistribution, there just does not exist a wealthy country without a, an extensive social safety net. For okay, a number so, of reasons. So here's a, here's a theory. You tell me what you think about this. So I've been trying to, let's say, steel man the positions of the left. I don't mean the radical left, I mean the moderate left, because I believe that the dialogue between the moderate left and the moderate right is what keeps our ship stabilized, essentially, and and, and for this reason. So imagine people have to group together cooperatively and competitively to solve 
difficult problems because we have difficult problems. That's entropy, let's say, and, and the assault of the natural world. So we have to group together. When we do that, we create hierarchies and we do that in large part, we hope, by elevating those who are the most competent at solving the problems to the higher positions in the hierarchies. Now that can be contaminated by power and tyranny and crookedness and poor selection and all of that, poor measurement. But fundamentally, if your hierarchy is functional, the more competent people rise to the top. Now, that produces the advantage of solving the problem, but it produces the disadvantage of making a lot of people stack up at the bottom of that hierarchy, because that's what tends to happen because of the Pareto distribution and the, and the, the, the built-in proclivity for inequality. So the answer to that seems to be, well, we produce the hierarchies, we accept the inequality, but then we attend with some degree of clarity of vision and care to those who are dispossessed by the necessity of the hierarchies. And your claim seems to be, from what you just said, is that that's essentially what we've been doing in civilized democracies for the last hundred years. And that that seems to be roughly working. Well, it is, uh, yes, uh, that's right. Now, whether or not the hierarchies are, uh, are optimal in the sense that we're better off with a hierarchy, uh, because of just what will happen in a, a distributed market economy, it, you may have winner-take-all situations where the, uh, the most entertaining story, the most efficient uh, car, the best washing machine in a global market will push out a lot of the competitors, and so you get that greater distribution. Whether or not it's uh, anyone would have designed it if they were to plan the entire society might even be beside the point. As long as you don't have central planning and distribution, it might naturally result uh, if, if it is not explicitly uh, opposed, which, which some of our policies do. Uh, as you mentioned, it's a little bit like, the, uh, like environmental progress in that far from being in opposition to economic growth, it's often economic growth that uh, let, lets people become more munif munificent, more uh, generous. There are a number of reasons why every wealthy country has a, a social safety net and why as countries get richer, like Brazil and India and China, they uh, turn their attention to uh, more, more social welfare. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the the, the uh, European and North American societies did it in the 20th century and the developing world is following suit. Partly it's because some of the investment in, some of the redistribution is investment, it's a public good. It's really good if the entire population is educated for everyone, including the people who are uh, hiring them. Uh, and so some of it is just investment in, in public goods. Some okay, of so it is that's good. another, that's that's another one. interesting take on the Marxist position, because the funny thing is, is that, you know, you lived in Montreal, I lived in Montreal. Montreal's a relatively flat city in some sense in terms of its economic distribution. Like there are no pockets of terrifying poverty, at least on the island. And it's a very safe place. And, and so it's socially rich in some sense. Like I always felt wealthy when I lived in Montreal, even though I was living on a PhD's um, uh, stipend, which was very Probably in the area, the area we used to call the student ghetto, which right. now has uh, luxury condominiums. Right, right. Uh -huh. well, but what was so lovely about Montreal was that it, it was safe, it was beautiful, and it had an unbelievably vibrant public culture. Yes. And that, and was it, all, it, that was all a consequence of the fact that people, generally speaking, were well enough off. And so, you know, if you contrast that with a country like Brazil, where a tiny minority of people have all the wealth, well, they're stuck with the problem of living in gilded prisons. They have to move their yeah. children around in helicopters. And, like... I think one of the things that people realize as societies become richer is that it's better to calculate your wealth on a broader level to include more people within the purview of what constitutes wealth for you. Because it's so nice to be in a city that's thriving and, and, and healthy and, and, and not crime ridden and resentful. And, and those need to be factored in as elements of individual wealth. 
That's right, and there is a, a, um, a debate among social scientists as to whether it is inequality that drives these other social goods, such as low crime, um, such as uh, public investment, such as education, or whether it's prosperity. It's not so easy to tell them apart because in general, poorer countries like South Africa and Brazil have sky high inequality. Countries like Norway and Sweden and Switzerland, which have less inequality, are also pretty rich. Uh, and, and it isn't uh, so easy to, to see which one is, is driving it. Because as societies get, get richer, um, as we've discussed, uh, they tend to redistribute partly out of um, investing in a public good, um, such as uh, lower crime, such as having an educated populace is just a, a really good thing. Partly it is literally insurance and, and the euphemism social safety net. Uh, that is something that captures you if you fall, captures the idea that even when people are well off, they worry that uh, they're, they're but for fortune go I, that, that uh, you got to be nice to people on the way up because you might need them on the way down. And, and so putting a, a bottom, uh, a floor on how poor you can be makes everyone feel a little more secure that if the worst thing happened, they would not be destitute. Yes, that's well, it's also is, not, that's it's a second that, It's not that uncommon for people who are in the top 10%, say, of the economic distribution, or even in the top 1%, to suffer a substantial reversal of fortune at some point in their life. And it's a very rare person, a very, very rare person, who isn't at economic danger of economic disadvantage at some point in their life for some reason. Well, certainly people move in and out of the, the um, top decile, top 10% of the income distribution. Uh, although this argument for social spending uh, would be to indemnify people against the, the worst outcome. I don't think that many people in the top 10th or to say nothing of the top 1% will ever go on welfare. But still, a lot of people in the middle class can imagine it and they don't want to think that they'll be out on the street if they, they lose their job or if they have, have a, a, suddenly suffer a big you know, medical expense. And the third reason after uh, investment and insurance is just um, uh, compassion or empathy. And we, we see in the history uh, of the West, uh, after the Industrial Revolution, you get a, a literature of, uh, of compassion for the poor. You, you have uh, the little match girl, you have Les Miserables, and Jean Valjean being in prison for stealing a bit of bread to save his uh, sister. You have the, uh, uh, the, the, the Jodes bearing grandpa on the side of Route 66 in uh, uh, Grapes of Wrath. And so people are also moved by sheer fellow feeling with their, uh, with their, their compatriots, their fellow citizens. Yeah, but maybe, maybe, maybe that's another reason why the people who are criticizing your um, informed optimism are irritated. Because, you know, if your fundamental political doctrine insists that well, every, your primary identity is your group, whatever that happens to be, and that the primary um, motivating factor for the function of your group is raw, naked power played out within that group against all other groups, the introduction of something like the notion of an implicit compassion for the downtrodden seems to like wreak havoc with the purity of that ideological position. But like, I've never met anyone in my life, and I know an, a large number of extraordinarily successful, economically successful people. I've never met anyone in my life who walks down the street and sees a down and out alcoholic who's clearly suffering terribly as a consequence of dwelling on the street. Um, what would you say? Celebrate the justice of the universe in elevating them above that person who's suffering. I mean, I think- Well, although we do from- people. Go ahead. I mean, we do know from, from social psychology that there is a, a tendency to, um, uh, to, to blame the victim, to believe that in a, in a just world. So it, I think those are two uh, motives that we have, compassion for everyone, but also a feeling that, that uh, those who are uh, badly off must have done something to, uh, to, to deserve it. And we, we do see this, of course, in the yeah. surveys that you and I are yeah, both Well, you familiar. see attention there because, of course- yeah, you see attention. I think that's yeah. right. And, and, and of I course, it is- it's also modulated by, um, by some degree of ethnic solidarity. And it's been noted that some of the generous welfare states of Europe have, at least historically, occurred 
in countries that are ethnically more homogeneous, uh, certainly racially more homogeneous than the United States, which tends to be a somewhat stingier. Now, this is not, a, it, there is some elasticity into what we cognitively categorize as our group. And one of the great achievements of any kind of nation building is to, uh, is to instill a feeling, well, we're all Canadians, or we're all, all Swiss, or we're all, we're all uh, Iraqi, something that has actually not happened in Iraq, which is a big problem. Uh, if you, unless you have that fictional family, that fictional clan uh, of a nation, then people tend not to cooperate, including in, in ways of um, providing social welfare for, for the worst off. And in the that's United a, States, that, uh, that's a ridiculously interesting point, I would say, because one of the things that you really see in Canada, for example, and, and our prime minister is a real devotee of this idea, is that there really is no Canadian culture. There's no central Canadian ethos. And what we have is a plurality of multicultural microcosms and that that's actually all for the best. Now, well, but, yes, the Canadian mosaic as opposed to the melting pot is a right, very old idea. Right. Although but, our, the prime minister's father, Pierre uh, Elliott Trudeau, famously tried to forge a kind of Canadian identity that spanned uh, English, the Anglophone and Francophone communities, hardly exemplified in himself because he was a dashing, charismatic figure who was distinctively Canadian. He just wasn't right. British, he wasn't French, he wasn't American, he had the rose in his lapel, he wore a cape, he was perfectly bilingual, he was debonair and witty and charming. And we all felt at the time, I remember this, I remember Trudeau mania, we all felt, now that is a Canadian, that's something to aspire to. And he did, with his policies and with his symbolism, forge a kind of Canadian consciousness above and beyond the mosaic of the Lebanese Canadians and the Italian Canadian, Jewish Canadians, and so on. Well, and su with sufficient, um, what would you call it, success to at least keep the country together, which was something quite remarkable. I mean, and well, he had to, at one point, he had to declare martial law to do it. I mean, yes. Was, uh, during the October crisis, when um, separatist terrorists kidnapped uh, a trade commissioner and a, and a uh, government minister. And, uh, right. And murdered him. Yeah. right, a dark day for Canada. Well, so, so look, it looks like there's a, there's a contradiction, maybe, and you can tell me what you think about this, in, the, in a certain element of leftist doctrine, because at, assuming that multiculturalism is, can be reasonably viewed as part of the leftist doctrine, if it is the case that people are more likely to be generous to those that they see in some sense as their in-group, then what it suggests is that you need to take the, the mosaic of, of your culture, the African Canadians and the European Canadians and the Asian Canadians, the same in the US, and have them maintain their, their culture and their traditions, but also to embed them inside a broader game that constitutes the national identity that unites them all despite their differences. And it seems like, given what you just described, that unless you can forge that trans-ethnic or trans-racial identity, that you motivate people to be less generous in their social policies. So well, that, that is true, and I, I consider this to be one of the, the uh, key ideas of uh, coming out of the Enlightenment, opposed by the counter-Enlightenment of the 19th century, by the Romantics and the, the, uh, the Nationalists, um, that, the, uh, that a, a, a state, a, a group of people under the jurisdiction of a government, are held together basically by a social contract, by an agreement that we're all in this together, there are many public goods that we, that, uh, we share, public costs that we can suffer, uh, a government that uh, uh, allows us to, to get along by serving in our interests is a way of improving our welfare, which is a very different conception of a nation than the blood and soil nationalism of the, uh, of the 19th century continuing well into the, uh, the 20th. That what makes us a nation is that we're all, uh, we're all white, we all speak, we uh, come from a, uh, the same ancestry, and that the successful nations are often ones that manage to forge this somewhat artificial identity. Okay, so that's also Canadian. fascinating because then, okay, then, then we got two arguments here for that, for that, uh, let's say, artificial or conceptual nation building process. One is that 
maybe you can allow people in their different ethnic and racial groups to maintain key elements of their identity and, and, and feel comfortable doing so, but also embed them in a broader game, like a game that's voluntarily played and laid out. But exactly. by, by the same token, given your logic, that's also the most effective antidote to the kind of nationalism that is identitarian, that also seems to be in the resurgence. And you see this, I, I really see this as having been done extraordinarily effectively in the United States. Now, they had the advantage of the examples of England and France, but that the American experiment was an experiment in conceptual nation building. It's like, here's exactly. a set of principles that we can all agree on despite our differences. And to the degree that we decide that we will agree on these principles, then we're the same enough. We can cooperate. We don't need to revert to nationalism or... or no, very much. In, in the Declaration of Independence, that was made crystal clear that to pursue uh, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, governments are formed with the consent of the governed to allow people to... to flourish to prosper. Nothing in the Declaration said anything about being European, being white, being Protestant, being, uh, being Christian. It was really a social contract uh, set up from first principles, which, of course, they had s some pretty big problems with, of course, the, uh, the African citizens. It took uh, quite a while to work that out. And there were tensions uh, in the 20th century with ways of immigration from, uh, from Ireland, from Eastern Europe, from, uh, from, from Jews from Italians, and there were, of course, tensions between the, the Italians and the Irish, but, but by the standards of human history, they got worked out pretty well. I think capitalizing on a feature of our psychology, which is that even though we do have an in-group favoritism, we do have tribalism, what counts as a tribe is pretty uh, elastic. It is yeah. not by skin color. Uh, we form coalitions that cut across skin color, and a successful uh, country is one that capitalizes on that elasticity, form a, a, a virtual tribe, which is simply every citizen of the country, and then ultimately every citizen in larger units, including the uh, humanity, including the, uh, all the world. A lot of this depends, though, on undermining certain features of human nature, such as kin solidarity. And it's been noted that in cultures that have a lot of cousin marriage, where you're related to people in your clan, it's rather hard to do nation building there, like in, like in uh, Iraq, for example. Mm -hmm. People don't have a sense of superordinate loyalty to a coalition above their blood relatives, and they are tightly tied to blood relatives by a cousin marriage. But this also played itself out in the history of the United States. I mean, there's a wonderful snatch of dialogue at the end of the first Godfather movie, when Michael Corleone uh, enlists after Pearl Harbor. And uh, his brother Sonny says, what, did you go to college to get stupid? Your country ate your blood. You're going to die out. You're going you're to be a sap who dies for strangers. Uh, and that is a perfect uh, uh, encapsulation of the difference between traditional tribalism uh, and the mentality that we need for a successful world. Right. Well, so it sounds like it's, you know, it sounds like one of the ways to combat right-wing identitarianism, that the new emergence of right-wing identitarianism is to make that conceptual distinction between national identity that's predicated on blood and soil, let's say kinship, direct kinship, or, or even secondary kinship, and these, these more abstract conceptions. Now, it seems to me, so just, to, just you may know this or you may not, but um, Ben Shapiro's new book is number one on the New York Times bestseller list. And I read Ben's book a while back, and I think it shares some features with your book, and it shares some features with my book. And I would say the features it shares with my book is that I stress the importance of the Judeo-Christian stories as part of that conceptual substructure that unites a civilization. And then it has features in common with your book because it's also a pro-enlightenment manifesto celebrating the achievements, let's say, of the Greeks and the rationalists moving forward from there. Like Shapiro sees our culture as, and this is something that I agree with, I would say, as a marriage between that Judeo-Christian tradition and that emergent enlightenment. Your, your 
and stop me if I'm wrong, but your emphasis, so let's say that we're playing this abstract conceptual game that unites us as a people, independent of our ethnicity and our race. And there are principles that constitute the game rules for that agreement. And you see those as primarily deriving from the Enlightenment and, and, and starting then. Well, not, I mean, there's nothing new under the sun, and certainly some Enlightenment ideas had uh, precursors in, the, in the, uh, the, the Renaissance and in ancient Greece. But that set of ideas that, that, that came together then, and it needed, of course, further elaboration. Uh, I think that that's much more of a, a, a basis of human progress than the Judeo-Christian tradition. Uh, again, any, every, uh, every intellectual movement draws from pre-existing ideas and moments, and so there was some uh, cherry-picking from, from the Judeo-Christian tradition, but uh, it certainly did not depend on belief in uh, Jesus Christ our Savior, it did not depend on a uh, one God as opposed to many gods, it really depended on hum human well-being, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's something you can believe in regardless of your theological so what, what do you think, so here, here's the um, question I have about that, is that, like, it seemed to me, so that the, 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 the people who formulated the Declaration of Independence, for example, accepted as self-evident that human beings were intrinsically valuable and the locus of sovereignty insofar as they were the citizens who would determine the course of the nation. And there's some recognition there, as far as I'm concerned, of intrinsic value outside of a rational argument, you know, it, 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 as, a, as, a, as an a priori presupposition. We accept these truths as self-evident, right? And, and, and the, the, the most fundamental truth of that is that it's something like, in my view, it's something like the strange metaphysical equivalence of man before God, the fact that we all have intrinsic value. And that's where I see the Enlightenment being irreducibly embedded inside this underlying structure. And that's, that's different than the idea of progress, which is something that, that you're focusing on and, that, and uh, that I think is more attributable to the development, let's say, of science and technology. But it still seems to me that the Enlightenment had to have an understructure that enabled it to emerge for those self-evident truths to be accepted universally as self-evident. And well, except I, mean, I agree that they're, that it, those aren't scientific ideas. I mean, this is, these are the set of ideas that I uh, draw together under the, the uh, rubric of humanism. It's not clear that um, the, that the self-evident right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is particularly Judeo-Christian. In fact, I, think, I don't think you could find that in uh, scripture. And in fact, in the Jewish tradition, uh, God chose the Jews. We're, we're the chosen people. So the idea of universal uh, of, uh, human uh, worth and, and well-being is not a particularly uh, Jewish notion. I don't think it's a particularly Christian notion. You've got to, it's only, you, you have to accept Jesus in order to uh, escape uh, uh, eternal damnation. None of that's in the Declaration. Uh, what's self-evident is are the things that are almost prerequisite to even considering uh, what ought to go into a country or, or anything else. Namely, you've got to be alive rather than dead. Uh, you've got to be able to uh, express opinions in order to even have that conversation. So you've got freedom. Happiness, uh, as we know from, from uh, evolutionary considerations, is basically the set of motives that kept our ancestors alive and allowed us to come into existence in the first place, combating uh, the grind of, of entropy. So I, I think that the foundation of that Enlightenment belief is not particularly Judeo-Christian, but more existential. It just comes from what are the actual prerequisites to being a uh, incarnate reasoning uh, creature. Okay, so I'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna press you on two elements of that. And I, I'm not disagreeing with you, by the way, because I'm not convinced that I'm right. It's just that these, this is how things have laid themselves out for me in my thinking. I mean, one of the things that's very interesting about the book of Genesis is that it insists that human beings are made in the image of God and that that gives them a, an intrinsic value and that they're made in the image of God 
regardless of whether they're male or female. And then I know the Jews emerge as the chosen people in the Old Testament, but there's also a strong idea, powerful conceptual idea in the Old Testament that emerges that the people of Israel, the true Israelites, are those who wrestle with God. So it's like an, it's like an, it's like an existential adventure. It's partly based on blood. It's partly based on ethnicity. But there's a conceptual idea, too, there, that there's the, the, the struggle for ethical endeavor, let's say, and the struggle for, for, for the discovery of the meaning of existence is actually what marks out the true follower of God. And then as Judaism transforms itself, at least in some part, into Christianity, what I see happening is that you, you get the idea that that identity with God that existed in Genesis, that, that, that intrinsic value, starts to become more humanized, that really manifests itself sort of fully in the Renaissance, that, that the religious figures start to become more individual, and that the idea that each individual does in fact have a divine worth be, that, that, that keeps the state at bay is part of what allows for the conception that people are deserving of the chance, independently of their ethnicity and their race and their creed and their sexuality, to do such things as pursue life, liberty, and happiness. And I see, because otherwise I can't see, I can't see where the ideas would have otherwise emerged during well, the Enlightenment. Yeah. Well, it's, um, you know, partly the Enlightenment uh, came about as a reaction to seeing what happens if you ground human worth in religious doctrines, such as the European wars of religion, uh, 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 unprecedented carnage, and, and together with the burning of heretics, uh, if you're, you're going back to, to uh, scriptures, particularly in the, uh, in the Hebrew Bible, um, God commands the Israelites to engage in one genocide after another. Uh, there is no uh, prohibition against slavery. There's no prohibition against rape. There's no prohibition against uh, grisly um, forms of torture uh, for for victimless crimes like uh, like working on the Sabbath. Uh, I don't I, I don't think it's very easy to come up come up with a notion of universal human rights from either scripture or Christianity. Uh, I think the reason that it happened in the in the Enlightenment. I mean, who knows why anything happened to the exact uh, moment that it did. Partly, it, it was a realization of the uh, um, the, the internecine carnage from the wars of religion. But also, it's uh, when you when you start to peel away um, scripture and dogma and uh, doctrine, what you're left with is our common humanity. Namely, uh, the there's no way that I can insist that uh, only my interests are special and you're not because I'm me and you're not. Uh, and and I hope for you to take take me seriously. As soon as we engage in any kind of discourse with diverse uh, other people, what we uh, are forced to, uh, to fall back on is what we have in common, namely we are uh, both sentient, we are both rational, we have the ability to suffer, we have the ability to flourish. Uh, I'm made of the same stuff as you, I can't claim that, that uh, if you don't suffer, uh, that would be a, a ludicrous proposition. And that's what gives you the notion of, of universal human rights and as government as a derivative means of, of uh, pursuing those rights, as opposed to, say, um, uh, divinely ordained um, uh, monarchy. Yeah, uh, it's, so, it's so hard in discussions hard. like this because it, it depends to some degree on your time frame and also on whether you take the broad picture or you concentrate on the details to some degree. Because, mm -hmm. like... I mean, I've got no objection to any of the descriptions of the horrors of religious tribalism that you just laid out. I mean, I would place that more in the domain of tribalism than in the domain of religion, because I think the tribalist tendency is the warlike tendency that the that's the, subordinate. Although the, the, the most severely punished heretics are often those within the tribe. Those are the ones where they really want to burn at the stake, as an example. Uh, so it's not, it, it is, I think there is tribalism. I think there's also um, a kind of um, a puritanical uh, uh, emphasis on, the, on, on pure essence, that anyone who contaminates the body politic must be 
um, uh, expelled. Uh, so oh yes, there's, there's definitely there's definitely that, and, and well, you see that with taboo violations in absolutely tribal in tribal societies and, as well. and authoritarianism. The idea oh, definitely. That, that challenging a legitimate authority is itself inherently uh, evil. It's not uh, the idea that criticizing the leader is essential to the health uh, of a nation, which is constitutive of our idea of democracy and freedom of speech. You, you have the ability to make fun of the president on, on uh, yes. TV without getting thrown and, into and the And the moral obligation to. And the moral obligation to. And that is a, that's a deeply unintuitive uh, feeling that the natural human tendency is to, we, we know this from the work of people like uh, Rick Schwader and John Haidt and, uh, uh, and others, is that les majeste, uh, attacking the king is a, uh, a, a mortal sin that legit, that hi hierarchies are themselves often moralized. That's a natural human idea that was uh, kind of, I guess as we'd say, deconstructed or, or rejected uh, during the Enlightenment, including the rationale for government laid out in the Declaration of Independence. It's a funny thing, eh? Because what I see happening is that over the thousands of years of of religious thinking, let's say, that, that went on in the West, is that what emerged initially was the idea that there was something akin to deity that characterized human beings. When, and, and that's stated very early on in the religious tradition, and in a very surprising way, partly because it's distributed between men and women equally. And it seems to be partly a creative function in that human beings partake in the co-creation of existence and partly an ethical function in that we're called upon to act courageously and truthfully. And, and that's, that's, that's the core idea, I think, that's expressed in Genesis. And it's, it's, a, it's a really sophisticated and demanding idea. And then I see it like the mustard seed that, that, that's part of the parable in the, in the New Testament. It's this tiny idea that takes root and against incredible odds manifests itself across the centuries until what we get is an increasing realization of the universality of humanity and that that constitutes part of the core of the enlightenment and you know you you made arguments about religious sectarianism and and also the and 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 religious like tribal warfare but the funny thing is is that i would say that the critics of your defense of the Western Enlightenment project might point to the same details in some sense and to say, well, um, look at the consequences of Enlightenment thinking. There's been endless warfare since the Enlightenment. There's been a tremendous generation of destructive technology. Um, the, the negatives which you can point to case by case and piece by piece, arguably outweigh the positives. I mean, I certainly don't believe that, but people could make that case. And so it's, it's so difficult eh, when, you're, when you're trying to take a, a long view of history to decide what, which part of the melody you focus on. Like, is it the deep, deep, yeah. deep or is it the, the details that, that, that seem to work against those themes. Yes, well, I, I of course, talk about the trajectory, historical trajectory of warfare in, in uh, some detail in The Better Angels of Our Nature, with, with something of a, <clears throat> of a uh, reprise in, in the uh, chapter on peace and enlightenment now. And it's certainly not true that wars increased after the enlightenment, quite the contrary. Uh, if you look at the percentage of years that the great powers of the day were at war with each other, it actually goes, goes down starting in the um, 17th century. Um, great power wars don't even occur anymore. We haven't had one for about 65 years. But the, it is, what happened was that, that in the centuries after the, uh, the 18th century, there were two trends that went in opposite directions, which is that wars actually got shorter and less frequent, but the ones that did occur uh, got deadlier. That is, it, countries got more efficient at killing more people in a shorter amount of time, partly because of of uh, weaponry, but also just because of, of uh, social organization, being able to conscript large numbers of uh, young men and then to send them to the battlefield as cannon fodder. Until, and, and a lot of that was driven actually by counter-enlightened ideologies of nationalism, which uh, led to both, uh, both world wars. Then um, 
Starting in 1945, for the first time, wars became less frequent, uh, shorter, and less deadly. And so the first time in, in, I think, in human history that you have a systematic move away from war uh, occurred after 1945 with the formation of the United Nations, with a kind of uh, unprecedented universalism, a kind of global consciousness, including all races, all religions, still not, of course, universally accepted, but even as an aspiration. Uh, that, that's something that's pretty new in human history. It, it did not occur during the time of the uh, European Enlightenment in the 18th century. Uh, but I think it, it, it was the, um, the consolidation of uh, Enlightenment ideals, including the formation of the United Nations, which was uh, called for by, uh, by Immanuel Kant in his essay, uh, Perpetual Peace, which of course did not happen at the time, uh, but, it, but we've enjoyed it since. And crucially for the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the United Nations, now the Sustainable Development Goals, you have people coming together, nations coming together, some of them not from a uh, Judeo-Christian tradition by, by any means, but who can agree on things like, well, it's really better if uh, people live than if they die of disease. It's better if babies uh, don't, don't die in their first uh, year of life. It's better if kids go to school. It's better if we don't go to war. It's better if we have a clean environment. All these things that we have in common because we're mm -hmm. human beings. Mm -hmm. uh, which well, we can agree on the, on the lack of utility of unnecessary suffering something like that, and maybe the, even the lack of the utility of unnecessary malevolence. That's something. Yes, you don't need to be, I mean, all you, have, you need to do to endorse that is be a human, is to have the ability to, to, to suffer or, or to flourish. So, okay, so let me switch this a bit, if you don't mind. Um, and I'd, I'd like to speak a bit more personally, if you would. Um, what's the consequence for you over the last year of this increasing public exposure and also controversy. And, and what do you think, just out of curiosity, about being associated with this loose IDW, you know, which oh, yes, a, no one really joined, but just emerged out of the blue. I mean, I think yes. of all the people in it, in some sense, you're the most surprising member because, well, well, yes, uh, yeah, you, you may be the prototype, uh, but, uh, and, you know, and I am uh, more peripheral. I think it just comes from being, uh, you know, just not, uh, not having uh, drunk the Kool-Aid of, uh, of political correctness, identitarianism, social justice, warfare, uh, wokeness. As long as you're, you're not uh, part of that tribe, as long as you haven't signed up to that, then, then uh, you get associated with this uh, this, this, of course, whimsical, humorous entity called the uh, intellectual dark, dark web. Right, right. So, uh, so you I mean, defined. I mean, it's a joke because, of course, there is a dark web. Right. Sell all well, kinds it's a of joke in all sorts of ways because it's a yeah. ridiculous club. I mean, I've been trying to figure out what characterizes the people who've been loosely aggregated in that association, you know, and I think that um, a certain fortunate independence is part of it. You know, that almost everyone in that group has their own means of support. I mean, you're a university professor, obviously, and that could be taken from you. But I mean, you have nine books and many of them are bestsellers. And like you, you have the means to keep yourself operating as an independent being um, without being dependent on any necessary external bureaucracy and I, I, well, I also have and I also have tenure which means that I'm a little harder to fire than most people in most jobs right right exactly so, so, uh, so, so that gives me a certain I used to be cynical about uh, about tenure is it's kind of a, a unique sinecure of university professors but there is part of the initial rationale namely give, giving you some degree of intellectual independence I'm really coming to appreciate and I, oh, oh, I don't yes. know tenure is yeah. like the Canadian Senate it's yes. useless, except when it's absolutely necessary. <laughs> right. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think it's really, and politically, of course, the people in this, I mean, there is no, there is, as we said, there is no such thing as an intellectual dark web, except as a kind of joke. But the people who are, are uh, connected to it, uh, I think have a certain amount of uh, unwillingness to, uh, to, to kowtow or bow down to some of the pieties 
that have become uh, orthodox on many college campuses and in some of the uh, elite uh, media. Because politically, the, the, the people who've been connected to it are, are uh, are pretty diverse. They're they're uh, very diverse. They're they're yeah. very they're, there's, there's there's almost the complete range except for the absence of people who are politically correct. The other thing that's very interesting about the group, two other things I would say, is that they've been very effective users of social media, and also they don't think that their audience is stupid. You know, yes, I think that's. Uh, I think that is that is a uh, uh, true, and it's uh, one of the keys to effective teaching, to effective communication. Uh, one of the, the first bits of advice I got when I made the crossover from academia to popular writing from an editor at a university press, she told me the, the mistake that academics often make when they uh, try to reach a broad audience is they talk down. They they assume that their audience is not as upright as they are. So the key is assume that your audience is your intellectual peer, but they happen not to know some stuff that you know. Right. And I offer that also as uh, writing advice in my book, The Sense of Style. But you're, but you're also right that this, uh, the, the independent-minded um, uh, people that we've been talking about uh, try not to use um, uh, insults and put-downs not uh, as a means of, of argument, not even so much... Um, the audience being stupider, but rather being evil. That if you don't agree with me, then you are a, uh, a rep reprehensible human being. Yeah, that that's definitely that's definitely a mistake with within the bounds of that group. Let's say I think it's a brand mistake. Let's say whenever that happens. So well, and of course yes, it yeah. almost defi that defines the the kind of uh, uh, political politically correct social justice uh, warfare that these people are reacting to, namely that the, uh, the, the mode of argument that I think we're all trying to, move to, to distance ourselves from is that if you don't agree with me, then you are a moral credit. Right, right. And so, okay, so now what's been the personal consequences for you? Like you've been at the center of a fair bit of controversy. And I mean, it's very difficult to have a series of best-selling books, for example, and speaking tours and so forth without being controversial in some way because it probably indicates that you're not saying anything of any real novelty or importance but what how has it affected you and and has it been a net positive or a net negative and, and how are people reacting to you oh it's un unquestionably uh, a net positive and at least so far i have um, i've certainly escaped the, the uh, kind of the, the outrage mobs that we know can be uh, um, aroused by advancing uh, 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 hetero heterodox opinions. Um, I have gotten, you know, some anger. I have, I was uh, subject of a rather bizarre incident where uh, a panel that I was on uh, called the, the Political Correctness uh, like Donald Trump, where some of my, uh, my remarks were uh, spliced in a video that was then uh, uh, cited by the um, by the by the alt right and, and neo Nazis, which led to a kind of denunciation on the left. Fortunately, in my case, I can't complain because the New York Times stepped into my defense. Uh, Jesse Singal wrote an op-ed uh, with my photo uh, adorning it, saying how how social media are making us stupid, and using the attack on me as evidence for the pathology of so social media. So I came out of that uh, uh, unscathed. Uh, on the other hand, I do live in in some degree of fear that, uh, that the mob could turn on me at any at any moment. Uh, there was a, a wonderful uh, um, essay by by Neil Ferguson expressing a, a similar fear. He said, "Well, m m my wife, who's made it of a uh, um, uh, braver stuff than I, tells me not to worry." The yeah, well, she's course. made of braver stuff than almost anyone <laughs> else in the world. So I don't. Well, know. That, that was that yeah. was the in joke, of course. His wife being Ayan Hirsi. Yeah, exactly. Lee, bravest people on the planet. But that was a, a sly little bit of humor for those who, who know his personal situation. And a reminder that people have withstood uh, much fiercer attacks than any of us have to worry about. Right, right, right. And how are people responding to you in public? Like when you're out in public, I mean, you're a, you're a rather striking figure, or you're easy to recognize. <laughs> yeah. what, what happens when you, when you go out? Well, how do oh, people respond uh, to you? Oh, it's um, uh, it, it, it's positive. I have nothing to complain about. 
Uh, people, people recognize me, and I expect after this, uh, what, what we're doing now airs, that I'll be recognized uh, e even more, because I know that you have uh, uh, quite a, a broad and diverse uh, following. Uh, but in, uh, also in person, as we know, people tend to mi often mitigate the kind of animosity that is easy to express in, uh, when, when you're uh, anonymous in, behind the, the, uh, uh, the shield of social media removing anonymity. But people are, are, are much more civil face to face. Uh, I have gotten, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, of, uh, of warmth. Um, I've gotten, to my surprise, a number of people writing to me saying that I have been good for their mental health. And as mm. I put in my Quillette essay, uh, even though technically, like you, I'm a psychologist. Unlike you, I'm not a clinical psychologist. I have no competence whatsoever in treating um, anxiety, depression, psychological problems. But for the, and I even have to explain to people when they ask me what, what I do for a living. I tend, I tend to avoid saying I'm, I'm a psychologist, even though that's what my degree is in my right. department. Because people assume that I'm a, a clinical psychologist, which I'm not. So I sometimes say I'm a cognitive scientist, because no one has any idea what, what that means. You know, I so, think you've been good for my mental health. Well, that's what some people, for the first time in my life, I, I say I, I've kind of earned that credential, but some people write in and they say, I just, I'm so uh, dejected and discouraged and downtrodden by reading the news that when I come across the data that you've presented that humanity has been improving, it actually is, is good for my mental health. I don't feel as despairing for, uh, for, for my children, for myself, for, for the future of, of uh, my country. Right. Well, that's a big that's, deal. And well, and you're also, it's more, it's more than that. It's not, it's not only that you're saying it's deeper than that for a couple of reasons. I mean, first of all, you're a credible source and like um, naive optimism is worse than cynical pessimism, I think, because it's too fragile, it's too easily damaged. But your optimism isn't naive, it's, it's data-based and it's well-researched. And so you can go in there as a pessimist, like as a powerful pessimist, and you can think, oh, oh, well, look at that, look at that, and, and look at that. And, and it's not just one or two things, it's, enough things so that it starts to be a story and you think oh well maybe we're not going to hell in a handbasket quite as fast as we thought we were and then at least not necessarily yeah well at least not necessarily yes well and that's that's something but then there's a there's a, an an implicit message there too which is perhaps the enlightenment message itself which is that well not only are things getting better but human beings are the sorts of creatures that could make things better if they chose to. And that's, and that's a radical message, I think. I mean, one of the things I've noticed about what people respond positively to in my lectures is my insistence to them that they could be, they may not be, but they could be, powerful forces for good and, and powerful beyond really in some ways beyond the limits of their imagination is that human beings unbounded rationally even from an enlightenment perspective independent of the metaphysics is that we do have the capacity to address incredibly complicated problems and with goodwill and caution and a certain degree of intelligence we can actually make them better and i think that that's a deeply positive message especially for young people who've been raised on nothing but a steady diet of disenfranchisement and like nihilistic pessimism about the future indeed and uh and it it, it has been a source of tension in my own um intellectual autobiography because and i i uh, note that I'm not a, an optimist about the human condition by, uh, by by ideology or by background. In fact, I wrote a book called The Blank Slate on the modern denial of human nature, mm -hmm. arguing that we're, we're not blank slates, that we are equipped by evolution with a, a, not, a lot of motives, some of which are not, not so uh, pleasant, not so conducive to human well-being, like tribalism, like authoritarianism, like, uh, like greed, like cognitive illusions, like self-deception. But that what, what uh, shifted my worldview was really coming across data that came as, a, as much a, a surprise to me as to anyone, showing that violence has gone down and mm -hmm. poverty has gone down and prosperity has gone up. 
And then have, trying to resolve that, that tension. How could we as a species both burn, our, burn each other alive and, and engage in, in rape and discrimination and genocide, but on the other hand, somehow manage to power this improvement? And I think it comes from the fact that we have, we're cog cognitively and psychologically complex. We have a number of ugly motives, but we also have uh, some modicum of empathy. We have self-control. We have uh, cognitive processes that allow us to reason. We have language that allows us to share our ideas. And if we manage to channel those with the right institutions, with a commitment to free speech, to democracy, to science, to empirical testing, um, then we can mobilize the, the better angels of our nature, as right. Abraham put them, and, and kind of eke out bits of improvement despite our worst selves. I but think it's quite comical that you used a religious analogy for that title. I mean, because I think to <laughs> part of the case that you're making, um, and I would say this is a narrative case to some degree, is that despite the depth of human depravity, which is definitely something that you did discuss in the blank slate, although not as intensely as some people have, that good, so to speak, has the capacity to triumph over evil and, and sorrow, despite the depths of both of those. And that, that is also an unbelievably optimistic message, because I don't believe that you can be a credible voice for optimism. And, and, and uh, what would you say, uh, uh, someone who celebrates the human spirit unless you're very cognizant of its depths, because otherwise you're just not informed. You're, you're no, just that, battling right. the right enemy. That, that's right. And you have to, uh, I think, value the hard-won human institutions and norms that don't necessarily uh, come naturally to us, um, like the rule of law, like, uh, like free speech, like empirical, uh, basing arguments on empirical data, things that are, have to be uh, inculcated every generation. Uh, we're not doing such a good job <laughs> with this generation, I sometimes think, uh, but it's because of these, these games that we've invented that bring out our, our better side uh, that we have been able to overcome our, our, um, our, our inner, inner demons, our darker angels. I wonder sometimes too, I wonder what you think about this. I mean, you know, when I grew up and when you grew up, um, you know, from the end of World War II until, let's say, 1989, there were real reasons for apocalyptic thinking, in, in my estimation. You know, mm -hmm. the, the, the massive buildup of the thermonuclear arsenal and the constant tension and testing between especially the Soviets and, and the Western Bloc. Um, the, the, the times when we came so close to nuclear annihilation I think for several generations, and then also in the 60s, the discovery of human beings as a, as let's say a planet transforming force on an ecological level. I think there were real reasons for people to be terrified into a kind of apocalyptic pessimism. And I kind of wonder sometimes if one of the things that you're not battling against is, what would you say is, is the revelation that that period of time in some sense is over, is that that particular apocalypse, yeah. God willing, has been reduced substantially in probability. And we can now start to think about the future in a positive way again. But man, it was 45 years, you know, and not counting World War II, which I think we probably should count. It was 45 yes. years where everyone was... Well, being, being taught that if they put themselves under their desks as elementary school, yes. that was going to protect them from an atomic blast. And so yes. I wonder no, if that, that is, I, coming out of that. No, that's true. I think 1989 truly was momentous. Uh, it was the, the end of the Cold War and the worst threats of uh, nuclear exchange. It also led to a decline in the number of proxy wars in uh, Asia and Africa and, and uh, South America which people don't appreciate. If you look at the, the horrific wars that are taking place now, such as in Yemen and Syria, and you might think that we're in an uh, you know, unprecedented area of warfare, but this is nothing compared to the 70s and 80s, where Africa was in flames, there were uh, 
the, the war in Vietnam killed far more people than the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and Syria co uh, combined. Uh, there were threats like uh, the, the Yom Kippur War in 1973. Richard Nixon raised the level of nuclear uh, alert, something that has not happened since. Uh, these really were perilous times. There's a, quite a, apart from the, from the Cold War, Iran and Iraq fought their version of World War I, which threatened to choke the flow of oil out of the Persian Gulf, bringing the world economy to a halt. And uh, we, we uh, lived through that. So the, people forget how, um, how, how awful the 60s, 70s, and 80s were in terms of... Uh, right. Well, and there was also and, the fact that, well, in Africa and in South America, I would say in particular, those proxy wars also being also ideological wars, absolutely stifled economic development, both in South America and in Africa. And I yes. think one of the reasons that we've seen this unparalleled improvement in economic conditions, let's say, well, it's obvious in China because of their market reforms, but in Africa is at least in part because there aren't, there isn't a coterie of insane Soviet dictators dictating economic policy to African leaders that's absolutely counterproductive and pathological. And so just by removing that source of, of, of trouble, much less adding anything new and good, just by getting rid of that source of trouble, the Africans have been able to free themselves from the worst excesses of the most foolish economic theories of the 20th century. And I, I really well, think yes, that there, started to manifest itself in the 2000s. It, it, that was part of it. And there is, the, uh, each affects the other. So that uh, poverty makes civil war more likely and uh, vice versa, because war is, has been called development in reverse. And uh, nothing is worse for an economy than you know, uh, schools are being blown up and people pulled out of their offices and shot and institutions destroyed as quickly as they can be built, markets, uh, transportation networks. Uh, but also if countries are poor, and then it's true that Marxist economic ideas make countries poor, then it becomes um, more attractive to join militias and, sure. and uh, rebel, rebel groups because the government isn't doing anything for you. And you've got a lot of uh, young men who have uh, nothing better to do uh, with their time. No loyalty is commanded by the incompetent government. Uh, and, and then, of course, uh, both superpowers would fund the insurgency movements that opposed uh, whichever government the, uh, um, the other superpower was supporting. So, right, and amplifying the problem. Consequently. Amplifying the problem. Yeah, mm -hmm. people forget, when people talk about what a terrible state the world is in now, they often forget how awful the Cold War was for the, uh, the, the what we now call the developing world, then called the Third World. Right, 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 which is, okay, so, so let, let me close with this, if, 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 if you would. We've had a good conversation. Um, um, what, what, are, what are you working on at the moment that's occupying you, that you have hopes for, and what are your general hopes, let's say, for the next three or four years? I mean, your career is ascendant in a manner that is true of very few people, and you have a tremendous global impact, I would say, all things considered, and one that as far as I'm concerned is overwhelmingly to the good. What's next for you and, and what would you like to see happen in the future for you over the, over the next few years? Well, for, for the world, I would certainly like to see a pushback against authoritarian populism and a uh, momentum going back to the forces of uh, of, of humanism, of cosmopolitanism, of globalism, of democracy, uh, against the uh, identitarian politics, primarily of the uh, populist right, since they are in power, uh, but also of the, the, the campus left. Uh, but the, the uh, renewal of the, the narrative that we, if we think about what we all have in common as human beings, and if we apply our brain power overcoming our, our uh, cognitive limitations, then we, we can solve problems. Uh, climate change being a big one, and I have my own uh, views on climate change. I'll ex express them in a, a New York Times editorial. It's coming out in a couple of days. It will oh, I'm looking forward to Is that going to get you in trouble? Uh, uh, yes, it, it will. Uh, and I'll, we'll leave, I'll, I'll leave that as uh, something. Okay. Something to be okay. Well, I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to seeing what you think. It's a very complicated um, problem. 
it is a very complicated problem, but uh, uh, and, and I think some of the activists are making it uh, making it more complex and, and, and making it worse. But I'll leave that as a, a little uh, enigma uh, until people check out that article. Although All there right. was a hint in enlightenment now. Okay. Uh, the other thing and academically? And academically, I've done a, um, a number of studies over the years taking off from an interest in how language is used in a social context. I, for, for a large part of my career, I studied language. And it made me curious about why we don't just blurt out what we mean so much of the time. We, we issue veiled threats, um, sexual come-ons that are kind of folded between the lines. Uh, we shilly-shally, we beat around the bush, we hint, we use euphemisms. Mm. That led me to the concept of uh, common knowledge in the game theorist sense of, I know something, you know something, I know you know it, you know that I know it, I know that you know that I know that you know that I know it ad infinitum. Or not, cases where we each know something, we're not so sure that the other guy knows that we know it. I think that's, mm. a, I think that's hugely powerful in our social and emotional lives. And I have a, I'm going to start writing a book in two years whose tentative title is Don't Go There, Common Knowledge and the Science of Civility, Hypocrisy, Outrage, and Taboo. Hmm. Uh, hmm. That, yeah. sounds, that, sounds, that sounds extremely interesting. I mean, one of the things that I've observed, you know, is that people, people have a hierarchy of values and that the deeper in the hierarchy the value is embedded, the more experiential reality is stabilized, the more it's united under a single goal and the more it's brought in out of uncertainty. And I think we have rules that are like, don't disrupt too much of someone's map territory with any given utterance. And so we, we, we tend a bit to play on the periphery, you know, like, it, it might be too much for you to stand to be outright objected by or uh, rejected by someone that you're sexually attracted to, you know, because it casts light on your validity as a acceptable source of DNA, let's say. But to play a bit and to tease a bit can allow you to accept a carefully and casually delivered playful rejection without it having to go way down into the depths of your character. It's like, to me, it's well, like a minimal necessary force doctrine. <laughs> Sorry about that technical snap. Yes, yeah, so I think there is, there is, there is a, a lot to that, just the ego threat of being uh, rejected. But in addition, I, we have, we divide our social relationships into qualitatively different categories. And um, a, uh, a sexual relationship really is different from a friendship or a workplace relationship. Uh, it is an inescapable fact that often people are sexually attracted to each other, sometimes one attracted to the other, but not, not vice versa. Yeah, uh, often. Though, <laughs> all too often, indeed. Um, and there is something that is uh, inherently threatening about a, say, a professional relationship, platonic friendship, if the sex is uh, kind of out there. If you blurt it out, even though paradoxically, any grown-up knows that there's got to be sexual attraction in a lot of heterosexual uh, relationships that are not overtly sexual. Uh, so he might know it, she might know it. But uh, we, as long as he doesn't know that she knows that he knows that she knows uh, that, that he knows it, then you can work under the fiction that the relationship is 100% platonic or 100% professional. There's something about blurting it out which generates common knowledge. Neither side can deny that the other one knows that they know it. Right. Unequivocally changes the qualitative nature of the relationship. Once it's, as we say... Once it's out there... It's out there, you can't take it back, the cat mm -hmm. is out of the bag, the bell can't be unrung, and it mm -hmm. changes the relationship. I wonder uh, too, if do you think it's because the explicit statement, imagine that you have implicit motivations, and many of them, and as implicit motivations, they have a relatively low probability of being manifested. But when you formalize that implicit motivation in speech, do you suppose you move the probability of enacting it 
up the hierarchy and therefore pose more of a threat to the other person? Is that the, that the speech is somehow closer to action than the? I think so, but I think it's even I think it's even deeper than that. I don't think it's just sort of an analog shift along a scale. There is something qualitatively different about blurting something out. Hmm. Is it, That's I for sure. We, I think we we subdivide our uh, relationships into into different types: uh, um, authority, um, uh, subordinate. Um, equal sharing and, uh, and communality of interests, uh, exchange, and these can take place over different uh, resources, over money, over sex, over uh, aid. And uh, we don't, we are very attentive to which one holds between a, in a given dyad in a particular time. Each one is a different coordination game, as the game theorists would put it, where we both win if we're on the in the same cell, if we're on the same page, but if we're we have discrepant understandings, then there can be, in mild form, awkwardness, embarrassment. In the extreme case, shock, uh, mm. outrage, fury. Mm. Yeah, well, it's reminiscent of the problem of dual relationships that are often talked about in professional ethics. You know that it's very, of course, very difficult to have a unidimensional relationship with someone, but you're constantly warned ethically not to, for example, if you're a clinical psychologist, not to make a friend out of your client. And to say nothing of a, of a sexual partner. Well, right? yes, to yes. say absolutely nothing of that. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I mean, these sorts of things happen between professors and students and so forth. And I think to some degree they're inevitable, but the dual relationship problem also means that you end up playing at least two games with different outcomes. And so the aims become blurry and the degree of conceptual confusion also increases. And now I'm not exactly sure why making that explicit would necessarily make it worse, but it does seem to be associated with an, uh, what would you call it? Un, an unwise complexification of the situation. Absolutely. And this is, it is that kind of social emotional uh, dynamic that I will be writing about in, in uh, Don't Go There. Uh, exactly that paradox. Hmm, hmm. Well, I'm very much looking forward to reading it. And um, I'd also, one of my dreams, by the way, I don't know what you think about this. Um, I think it would be fun, and I suppose this is perhaps an invitation. I think it would be fun to sit down with you and Ben Shapiro and have a talk about religion and the enlightenment and, and the state of the modern world. I don't know if you'd ever be interested in doing something like that. Not a political discussion, you know, but, a, but a, because I, th I think there is, mm -hmm. there is something to be fought out in a serious way between the Enlightenment types like you and, and like Sam Harris, for example, because I would put him in the same, well, not in the same category, but in a similar Yeah, category. no, I think we're, 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 we're uh, there's a lot of overlap. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and, and, yes. and then people like Sam, like Ben and I, who are, and, and maybe the, the Jungian analysts, uh, for example, who tend to view the historical movement towards increased freedom and prosperity as a longer process. Uh, there's really something there that needs to be hashed out, and it's really complicated and might be fun to have a conversation about that at some point if you if you're ever interested in if you ever have the time I, I accept the invitation we'll, we'll all right all right well I'll talk to Ben because it, okay it, 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 I, I think we could have a good conversation you know and and mm -hmm. and scrap it out a bit um, and see if we could get somewhere. Because like, okay. I, like, I really liked your books, you know, I, I really liked Enlightenment Now, and I regard myself in many ways as, as a pro-Enlightenment figure. I mean, I'm very scientifically minded. I've done a lot of, of, of empirical research and learned a tremendous amount from it. And I certainly believe that the mastery of science and technology has been a major contributor to the furtherance of, of human well-being. And, and there's something to be said for the solidity of an objective materialist view of the world. But there's, there's an element there that seems to me to be troublesome, that, that, that leads to a kind of nihilism, which, which interestingly enough, you happen to be fighting with some of your optimism, which is quite, quite nice to see. 
but I think there's fertile discussion there to, to, to reconcile, maybe to reconcile some of the unnecessary tension between the different streams of thought that have made Western culture and world culture for that matter, the, the remarkable creation that it actually is. I, I think that could be fruitful, indeed. All right, well, is there anything else that you'd like to mention to people? Any forthcoming talks you have or public appearances or things you'd like to draw their attention to or are we, are we at the end of a fruitful discussion? Uh, the, the problem is we could, we could just keep going. Uh, so where, where to start? I will be, I, I'm uh, often on the road, I'm often given public, public uh, lectures and discussions. I have one, I'm, I'm having a public event with Paul Krugman next week at Brown University. It may not be next week by the time this, uh, this circulates, it may be in the past tense by then. Uh, but yeah, on my website, I have a list of upcoming events. Uh, okay, okay. okay. Well, it's pretty fun to see that there's a public audience for this sort of discussion, eh? Who would have guessed? Much more, much more than anyone would have guessed just uh, about five years ago. There's yeah, it's, it's uh, remarkable. It's remarkable. For, uh, for ideas yeah. and uh, debate, absolutely. Another reason for optimism. Let's hope. Very nice talking to you, and thank you very much for taking the time. And um, good luck with your your talks and your and your academic endeavors, and with your attempts to help people understand that there's reason to be hopeful now, and perhaps even more reason to be hopeful in the future and about people. That's a hell of a thing for. Someone who doesn't think there's a blank slate. <laughs> Indeed. Thank you, Jordan. Thanks for having me on. Great pleasure talking with you. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you. Let's stay in touch. Bye-bye. Okay, bye. -bye. bye.